Thanks, bro. Well, again, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 1. Uh, is where we will be this morning. I know for some of you who are clock watchers, I already looked at your clock and realized Justin didn't get up here until 1045. Uh, we're in trouble. Uh, but uh, we won't, I won't be too, too long this morning. Uh, but Romans chapter, chapter 1. Uh, to be completely honest with you, uh, ever since we went to more of the expositional way of preaching and going from verse to verse, book to book, we always know what's next. On Sundays in which... We're not in those, finding, just thinking about what the Lord has for me on this one Sunday. It gets a little more tough, if you will, uh, because you get in a system of routine. The text is telling you what to preach on. You don't have to think too hard about it. It's actually, if you're dumb like me, it's the easiest way to do it. Uh, but uh, about midweek this week, I began thinking about just the word unashamed of the gospel. Uh, and, and it's interesting that uh, me and Luke were talking, I know uh, since I have been here, I've made mention of Romans 1.16, but I don't know if I've ever actually preached through the, that section in Romans 1 where Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel. And I thought it'd be a great Sunday to do it, A, because we're having baptism, and ultimately that's what they're proclaiming is we are unashamed of the gospel. We're unashamed of the work that Christ has done in my life. And also uh, with teachers, I know for for some of us, uh, we have teachers that have already been teaching with the city school district and things like that, but the county begins back next week, and it's an op- awesome opportunity for us just to be reminded, hey, let's be unashamed of what the gospel is and what it does in our life. And a few years ago, I preached a series called Gospel Driven Church and uh, what it looks like for, for to be gospel-centric as a body, uh, individually, as individual members, but as a body of Christ, uh, and specifically in the uh, in, in the local body that we call Cross Point Church. And I made a statement, I reminded us that a gospel-centered church is a church that's constantly reminding themselves of the gospel. Uh, that there will be times in our life of a church that we'll hit the brakes and we'll be reminded of the gospel. And that we'll hit the brakes and go, this is what the gospel is, this is what the gospel has done. It's so important to be reminded by the gospel that we actually have a verse in scripture that says, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, he says, hey, I want to remind you of the gospel, which you have heard, which you have received, which you, uh, which you stand in, which you're being saved. Uh, and, and so that's important for us to remember. If the Corinthians need to be reminded of the gospel, guess who else need to be reminded of the gospel? Or maybe I'm the only one that doesn't wake up in gospel mode every morning. Uh, maybe, yeah, thank you, Mr. Butch. There's a testimony back there. We don't wake up in gospel mode every morning. What I mean by that is oftentimes my, let me say, my joyness to be around uh, uh, it depends on how much sleep I got the night before. Uh, I don't always wake up ready to preach Jesus to the to the crowds and love my neighbor and turn the other cheek and uh, and just uh, I could start a good day uh, but then on my way to church somebody cuts me off and I lose all my gospel in me right uh, or or I go to Walmart and I'm in the biggest lie from Hades the, the uh, express lane uh, self checkout supposed to be fast and you have people up there bartering trying to buy stuff uh, and they just need to get out of the way like and we we need to be reminded of the gospel because we don't always uh, wake up in gospel mode and so the Corinthians fall say I want to remind you of the gospel what it is what it's done in your life and so oftentimes we need to be reminded and the reality is oftentimes let's be honest for a moment as a church When we remind ourselves of the gospel, which we should, we remind ourselves how good the gospel is and what God has done on our behalf and what and who who I once was, but now by the grace of God, this is what God has done in my life. We remind ourselves of the great things of the gospel and we should. However, this morning, I want to remind us of another side of the gospel. And that is this. When you and I believe, receive, and believe in the gospel, yes, it does a mighty work in our life, but also, listen to me, we now have a responsibility of what we do with it. And oftentimes, we get so happy, and and obviously we should, joyful about talking about the gospel. The gospel is this, and this is what it's done in my life. But by us choosing to believe in the gospel, now you and I are held accountable with what we do with that great message. So this morning in Romans Chapter 1, Paul's in Corinth when he's writing this letter, and here's Phoebe is going to Rome. There's a church there that Paul wants to get to the 
church in Rome. Uh, we'll see in the next couple, uh, in two weeks from now, when we get back studying the book of Acts, we'll see him in Rome. It's going to be awesome. But he, he hadn't been there yet, but he had heard about the church, and he sent a letter to Phoebe. And look at verse 14 is where we'll start in this text. Paul writes to the Romans, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. For I am unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. We pray now as we turn our eyes to it. God, you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to believe uh, that which you have for us this morning. God, remind us not just of the goodness of the gospel, what Christ has done on our behalf, but now our responsibility to be good stewards of that great gospel message this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Three things I want to see in this text. First of all is gospel obligation. Second will be gospel conviction. Third will be gospel transformation. So number one, if you're taking notes, gospel obligation. Notice those words that Paul writes in verse 14. He says, I am under obligation. And notice who he says he's in obligation to. He says to who? The Greeks. Uh, I am under obligation to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish. So oftentimes when we think about this text and our debt or our, our obligation to preach, obviously we think about it in, in, in regards to God, but ultimately what this text is saying is that Paul had, uh, he felt an obligation deep within him that he was to preach the gospel to those who were foolish, those who were wise, those who were Greeks, those who were barbarians, those who were pagans, those who were Jews. He had a great obligation to preach the gospel to, to these people. One writer that I read this week, I think it was John Stott, said there are two ways in which we uh, become to where we're in debt. One, the first way we get in debt is one way we're all thinking about it, is that I borrow money from somebody. I see Sawyer back there with the bank. I'm in debt to community bank, right? And so we borrow money from somebody, we become in debt. However, there's another way in becoming in debt. Let's just say, just for example, Luke needed money. And Philip Slaughter gave me money to give to Luke. Now I'm in debt to Luke until I give him that money. There's a gift in which I've been told to give to him, and I'm in debt to Luke until I give him that money. And that's the picture of what Paul is saying, is that God has given him this gospel message to preach to the, to, the, to the Greeks, to the barbarians. And until he does it, he is in debt to them. There's an obligation that Paul had to get to Rome, to preach to barbarians, to preach to the Greeks, because God had entrusted him with a great message to share. You and I, just like Paul, we have been entrusted with this message of the gospel to, be, to share with those around us. We are under debt to them until we deliver it to them. There's a gospel obligation for all of us who have claimed the name of Jesus. Let's, let's celebrate what the gospel has done in our lives. May we never forget the good news of Jesus Christ, how we were once dead in sin, but he made us alive in Christ. He made all things new. May we never forget the hope and the peace and the security that we have in Christ, but by no means may we never keep that to ourselves. May, may we never bloat and boast in what the Lord has done while ignoring our neighbor who we know who needs it. We may, be, may not be like Paul who's called to go specifically to Rome, but you, you live where you live, you work where you work, you play where you play, not by accident that God has placed you in that place because there are people who are, you're in debt to until you share the gospel with them. So Justin, that's tough this morning. Hey, we need to be reminded that we are called to be good stewards of this gospel that we hope in. Paul says, man, I'm under obligation. I've got to go. I mean, and we're familiar with Paul because we've been walking through Acts for so long. There, before Paul gets to, in order for him to get to Rome, he first has to get to Jerusalem, right? And, and he knows that it's going to be tough for him, that this Holy Spirit already told him it's going to be tough for him in Jerusalem. He may not make it to Rome. Even if he get, did get to Rome, it probably wasn't going to be easy. But he said, listen to me, I'm under obligation to get it there. And so I would ask us to stop this morning and pray and ask the Lord who is it in my life 
that I have an obligation to share the gospel with. Because that is a call for all of us believers. We have no liberty to keep it to ourselves. And look what that realization of the obligation does. Look at verse 15. So, I like sometimes when Paul just writes, he's like, I'm under obligation, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. It's just very natural. So I'm eager. So I'm eager. There's an eagerness that connects to the obligation. Isn't that a crazy thing to think about? That oftentimes we view obligation in a sense of like, man, I've got to do that. Right? You follow me? Like the, the, the things that I'm obligated to do, sometimes they're joyful. But sometimes you just got to do it, right? But Paul is meeting this obligation with an eagerness and a, an anticipation and excitement. Why? Why was Paul so excited to go preach the gospel? Why? And under this obligation, he didn't look at this obligation as something that was drudgery. He answers it in verse 16. He says this, For I am unashamed, or not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why could Paul look at this obligation that he was in a debt to these Gentiles and Greeks and barbarians and fulfill that obligation with great eagerness because he believed that the message he held is the only hope for all of mankind. So the first thing we see is there's this great obligation. Secondly, there's a gospel conviction. Look at verse 16 again. It says, I, for I am unashamed of the gospel. I'm unashamed of the gospel that no matter what I face, I'm unashamed of it. I will not be shamed by the gospel. And I began to think this week as I thought about Paul, if there was anyone that had a reason to be ashamed of the gospel, it would be Paul. Hey, let's think through, I know a lot of you are guests here, but for Crossman people, let's think through the book of Acts so far real quick. He was imprisoned in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Damascus and Berea, laughed at in Athens, considered foolish in Corinth, declared a blasphemer and lawbreaker in Jerusalem. He was stoned and left for dead in Lystra and was branded, branded as an idolater. But he was not intimidated by the religious, the educated, or the influential. He was now eager to preach it at the epicenter of paganism in Rome. He was never deterred by opposition, never disheartened by his criticism, never ashamed for any reason. And even though the gospel was a stumbling block, he knew it was still the power of God to save. His conviction drove him. No matter what roadblock he may face, ridicule, cynicism, he was going to preach the gospel. He was going to share the gospel. The gospel is a stumbling block to many. It undermines self-righteousness and it challenges self-indulgence. But Paul was unashamed. And no matter what he was going to walk into, no matter how hospitable the environment or the conversation may or may not go, how good it may or may not go, he says, I, no matter what, I'm unashamed of sharing the gospel. May it be, may, I may lose a friend, I could lose a job, I could lose a life, I could lose whatever, I'm unashamed of the gospel. Why? Why was he so unashamed of the gospel? I want to look there at verse 16. There are four words in 16 that I want to point out. First of all, he says this. I'm unashamed of the gospel. And he says four. says, this is why I'm unashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God. That the gospel is the power of God of God. The word there is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite, or dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. There's this, that the gospel is powerful, like an explosion, dynamite, if you will. Paul says, listen to me. I, I, am, I am under great uh, obligation to go and preach the gospel. I'm eager to go preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The word power there, that it is God-given that there's a miraculous thing that happens that you and I forget about is that it, the gospel is the means in which God saves men and women. We don't have to make it impressive and flattering with words. That's what I love about when we do baptism and we get to sit down and, 
and talk to people about their story and like what is the gospel. And you get you get stuff from obviously the very basis where God Christ came, he lived, he died, he's buried, he rose again, he ascended, he sent it right into the Father. Then you have some like Braxton who will uh, spend like when their membership meeting, Jessica was like, it's this, and Braxton was like, 20 minutes later, still telling us what the gospel is. That's what's so beautiful about the gospel, that it is, it is basic enough that a child can understand it. But it's big enough and dynamic enough that we'll need all of eternity to be able to barely understand it. You follow me? And that's what's so beautiful and big about the gospel. And so it is the power of God. That God in his, and I can't explain it, but this way that God has designed it is that those who come to faith come to faith through the preaching of the gospel. That supernaturally, whenever the man of God, woman of God, they share the gospel with somebody, that the Holy Spirit's at work in that special message. I don't understand it completely, but I'm going to be faithful to preach it because it is by that message that God has designed to build his church. So we, it's the power of God, that God's power rests, if you will, into the preaching of this gospel. Then it says, it is the power of God for salvation. That second word is salvation. Why are we unashamed of the gospel? Because it is the gospel that the power of God goes forth in, and it is by it and only through it can man be, be saved. Only by it. Not by the schemes of man, not by our pragmatic approach to do things. Simply by the preaching of the gospel, men and women come to know Jesus. It's through the preaching of the gospel that salvation, what is salvation? Listen to me. You may be asking, Justin, what is the, what is the gospel? You should have started with defining the gospel. I don't even know what that is. Here's the gospel is that you and I, we have no hope in ourselves. But God is holy and he's just. He's merciful and he's loving. And the gospel is this, is that ultimately God did for us what we cannot do for ourselves by sending his son to live a perfect sin-free life, to die on a cross, to be buried in the grave, to be raised again, conquering hell, conquering sin. So you and I are in a predicament. Actually, I was having a conversation this week. Here's a the, an elementary way to understand what it means, what salvation means. When I say salvation, Romans 6.23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. And if we were sitting in my office, I would ask you this, what is a wage? And you would say, some of you say, I don't know, but most of you say a wage is something that you get paid. So if you have a job and you work X amount, of, if you, let's just say you make $10 an hour, you work 20 hours, you make 200 bucks. You earn, you deserve your $200, nothing more, nothing less. You deserve that. That is the, the, the earnings of your work. So when the Bible says the, the wages, what your sin earns you, what it deserves you, it is death. What should be a credit to your and mine account is death. Physical death and spiritual death for all of eternity. But thankfully, there's a big but in Romans 6, 23. It says, but the grace or the gift of God. Gift. How is it contrasts with wage? Gift is not something I earn. It's not something I work for and deserve. It's simply a gift. And that's what it means to be saved, is that on our own account, the wages of our life deserves death. But God, the gift of God, is eternal life in his son. That he saves you and me from what our sin deserves and places on us life and in us life. That's what, when I say salvation, in a nutshell, that's what we mean. And some of us need to be reminded because we've gotten real sophisticated and sanctified in our life, and we forgot how sinful we were and how helpless and hopeless we are apart from Christ. Listen to me. Even on our best day, we still fall short. There's nothing in us. So what does it mean about salvation? That God, 
It is the power of God to be able to take lost sinners and make them holy, to make hopeless people and give them hope, people who are frantic and not have anything in life to give them peace and joy to give them life. Next word, to everyone. Everybody say everyone. To everyone. It is the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone. Who Notice who he has said so far. He has said, I, I, am, I am obligation to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to, to the wise and to the foolish. It is all people, everyone, anyone who would trust in Jesus, the power of the gospel can save them to all who trust in him. Everyone. And this is everyone who what? Believes. So why was Paul, even this obligation that he knew may take his life, he may get ridiculed, called a dummy by the sophisticated, uh, a sinner by the religious. Why was he so unashamed to preach it no matter what? Because he believed, again, it was the power of God for salvation for everyone who would believe. This believe is, it's a placing trust in. It's pretty synonymous with the next word you see in verse 17, is faith. This is what's so great about the gospel. Paul came from a background that, yes, there was a, a hope in God, but it was filled with knowing all the right things, doing all the right things, saying all the right things. And here's the good news of the gospel, is that it is God's gift for everyone. Listen to me. It doesn't say everyone who tries harder. It doesn't say for everyone who comes to church maybe three out of the four weeks, two, we give them some breaks there. It doesn't say for everyone who, that's what I love about this, not everyone who is raised in a Christian home. everyone who believes. Everyone who would say, I understand the wages of my sin is death, but I believe that God sent his son to pay for my sin and forgive me of all my sin. And it's as simple as I believe in him. I trust in him. And the good news is, you don't even have to be able to completely explain that one to get saved. You just have to have the simple knowledge, man, I'm lost, but God has sent his son to die for my sin. You may not be able to explain and list all your sins, that's okay, but you know where you stand before God and you see Christ as the Savior of the world and say, I I trust in him. I don't 100% know what all that means. It's okay. All who would believe. So maybe this morning God is calling someone even here this morning to trust. And Justin, that seems very childlike. Listen to me. We come to God in a childlike faith. And listen to me. The more mature your faith, the more mature your knowledge is to me, the more childlike your faith will become. So, Justin, what does that mean? I thought I'm supposed to grow mature. Yeah, but the more mature you are in Christ, the more childlike you are in your faith. What that means is the more I come to know God, the more I understand his goodness and his, and his might and his power and his plan, the more I go, whatever he says, I'm good with it. It may start with just simple belief, but the more I grow, more I grow in knowledge, the more childlike my faith becomes. The more I see him as the reigning, ruling, sovereign one, the more I submit and go, yes. Everyone who believes. So, here's the kicker for me and you who name the name of Christ. We must come to an understanding, do we believe Romans 1.16? Do we believe that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. If we believe that, then there's no room 
for not sharing it with others. If that is the only place, only message that God has inspired and ordained to bring man from life, from death to life, then you and I must. The gospel, according to these couple verses, is a debt to discharge and a power to experience. Thirdly, in verse 17, we see gospel transformation. Verse 17, it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So for in it, that it would be the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And this is, I wish I could preach this verse when I didn't have a bunch of other things going on on Sunday because a lot to how the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. Um, And so I'm just going to kind of hover way up above and kind of give some ideas what it means for inside the gospel and people come to trust that we see the righteousness of God. I think this righteousness of God revealed speaks to his character. In the gospel, we see... We see the loving kindness of God. We see the patience of God. We see, uh, but also we see the, the judgment of God. We see the wrath of God. In the gospel message that Christ died in the place of sinners, that he, the Son was crushed by the Father as a payment of sin, we see both his holiness and his mercy. We see both his justice and his grace. And so understanding just in the the gospel itself, the righteousness of God is revealed in his character because we see who he is through the gospel. We see that he's both loving and and merciful, or loving and wrathful. We see all the whole picture of his character. But I also think the righteousness of God being revealed is also we see his activity. And not only is he a God who is in heaven, sovereignly ruling the universe, but he initiated by sending his son. He initiated this gospel message by taking on the form of man and coming to live among us, to die on a cross, to be buried in a grave, to be raised again. In the gospel, not only do we see the character of God, but we see the activity of God, that he didn't, he saw our condition and he didn't say, oh, you got to get good enough to come to me. He came to us. But also in the gospel, his righteousness being revealed is we see his achievement. That not only is he a God who is all these things, not only is he a God who's done all these things, he is a God who's provided salvation for all who will believe. The activity was successful, if you will. The father achieved, or the son achieved the will of the father. So in the gospel, when we preach the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed. We do see in the gospel message his character. We see his activity, but we see the work of the Son, the completed work of the Son, that all who would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen to me. Whenever we are preaching the gospel, people are trusting in the gospel and living by faith, it is a time in which the through you and me, as we meet together, we preach the gospel, we receive the gospel, believe in the gospel, as we share the gospel, what we're doing supernaturally is the very character, the nature, the righteousness of God is being revealed upon humanity. That's a crazy task. I said there's so many layers. That's just, I'm only like right here right now in that. So let me read some things. What does that mean? It is a righteous status which God requires if we are ever to stand before him, which he achieves through the atoning sacrifice of the cross, which he reveals in the gospel, and which he bestows freely on all who trust in Jesus Christ. Or another guy says like this, it's God's initiative in putting sinners right with himself by bestowing on them a righteousness which is not of their own but his. John MacArthur says like this, God's uh, the righteousness of God being revealed is, is God's just justification of the unjust, high righteous way, his, high, his righteous way of pronouncing the unrighteous righteous in which he both demonstrates his righteousness and gives righteousness to us. And he has done it through Christ, the righteous one who died for the unrighteous. And it do, he does it by faith when we put our trust in him and cry out for mercy. That through the gospel, the very nature, the righteousness of God is revealed. Then it says, from faith to faith. 
It's another one where I need a whole lot more time to understand what he's talking about. It sounds like a good catchy song from Faith to Faith. Or Anyway, grace upon grace, faith to faith. What is, what is he saying there? I think it connects to those who believe, but the sense is which that we come to God, this, this gospel message, and, 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 and God's nature, his, his, his righteousness is revealed when someone has faith in him. I think it starts there. But what it's teaching us is that this faith that you and I have is not just a one-time faith. From faith to faith. And so let me bring up all the scenarios that it could be. Okay? It could be saying that it starts with God, then it goes to our faith, or our faith to others. It could mean that our faith continuing from one degree to the next. That from first faith to the last faith, it's all faith. Or it could even mean that for the one who is trusted in the gospel through faith, we begin to share the gospel, and if it goes from my faith to somebody else's faith, that from throughout generations, faith to faith to faith in the gospel, God's righteousness is being revealed upon the earth. This gospel message isn't for us to take home. It's, it's a generational message from faith to faith to faith to faith. God's righteousness is revealed when people walk by faith. Look at that in there. Here's the transformation. The righteous shall live by faith. That's a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2. So Justin, how I thought we weren't righteous. We're not on our own. That verse could actually probably be better translated. He who has been made righteous will live by faith that there is a passive act that happened to me, that God did to me, and because I have been made righteous, I will walk in faith. That God has done a work in us, and the fruit of that is we walk by faith, and what happens from faith to faith of those who are walking in submission to God, preaching the gospel, as the very righteousness of God is made known upon the earth. This morning, if you have not yet believed in Jesus, may today be the day that you place your faith in Christ. After the service, Luke and I and Paul and Daniel will be, made, will be available uh, if you want to come and talk, and maybe even through the last song, if you want to come talk. But <clears throat> practically as the church, you may have noticed that we did not do gospel reach at the beginning of the service. We did scripture reading straight into baptism. And the way that we, reason why we wanted to uh, we're going to do gospel reach as a response to uh, preaching the gospel and being instruments of the gospel. And so, like I said, I know Laurel and other schools have already started back, but our church is full of teachers. And I've seen Mr. Vaughn back there, who's the principal of West Jones Elementary. Uh, and so how we want to pray, so gospel reach for us is where we pray for churches, ministry partners, people groups, and things like that. What we want to do is we want to ask all of our teachers, anybody who works inside the school district or the Jones County Law or whatever, we want to count you to come make kind of a line across the front. Uh, now, one, two, three. Uh, come stand up here. Uh, and what we want to we simply as a church, we want to lift you up. We want to pray for you. Uh, and so you don't have to be a member of Crosspoint to do this. Uh, if you work in uh, any kind of education, you're going back. Ryan, Kelly, get, get up here. <laughs> <clears throat> Y'all can, y'all can scrunch in. <clears throat> and so obviously I know, uh, and we have some across the, hall, across the way in the building. Ashley's over there. Uh, and being married to a teacher, uh, I know the, uh, the ins and outs of teacher life and things like that. And, uh, and so uh, we as a church, I want you all to look out, even if you're not a member of Crosspoint, I want you to know that we as a church are lifting you y'all up uh, as you start back tomorrow. I know you've been back in the classroom for a while, but as students start coming in, uh, we pray that, that God would use you uh, to be instruments of, your God, of the gospel message in the lives of those kids and family. And so uh, I'm going to pray for you real quick. I know it made it awkward for you, uh, but uh, let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. 
God, I thank you for these teachers and principals and, and the faculty that are up here uh, today. God, I thank you for what they mean to our community. God, I, they, these people that are standing before have spend more time with, with uh, kids than most of the, even their parents do. And so, God, I pray that you use them. God, when the enemy's whispering words of discouragement, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind them that their life is, is, is on purpose, that they mean, they mean something, that they matter, that what they do is important. God, that they do make a difference. Uh, sometimes that seems like a high hill to climb, but God, they are making a difference and remind them of that. God, use them. Use them for your glory. Use them to be instruments of your gospel through the way that they love on these kiddos, the way that they interact with their parents. May they be instruments for you. God, we love you. We thank you for these people. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Thank y'all so much for letting me embarrass you. Y'all go grab a seat. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we'll give them a hand. <clears throat>